From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We are joined with our guest producer, JJ Causeway, Pauseway, JJ Press, Pause, Pauseway, JJ B Day, Pauseway. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. As you are listening, folks, we'd like to welcome you to 2023. We are recording one of the last things we'll do in 2022. And we thought, what better way to end the year for us and what better way to start the year with you than to go to an unsolved mystery, a very deep one that gets very murky very quickly. As a matter of fact, I would say... um, Today's episode is a study in extremes, the extremes of financial wealth, the very high reaches of it, and the extremes of brutal crime. On December 13th, as far as people can tell, as far as forensics assures us, 2017, a tragedy struck the Sherman family, a couple living out in Canada. Here are the facts. It's a good life. It's good to be king. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, well, they're they're definitely lords, right? At, at least um, Barry certainly was a lord of drugs, <laughs> a drug lord, perhaps. <laughs> he was a dance, literally, perhaps. No, literally uh, a drug lord. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but not. There may maybe have been in the some way, dance involved, but uh, yeah, mainly not drugs. the way you're thinking. Uh, not not a drug lord in the sense of uh, one of these movies or TV shows you might watch. He was the owner of a company that produced uh, generic drugs. So generic versions of all those big name drugs you see the all the commercials for. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was living with his wife, Honey, uh, who was a philanthropist of great note. Uh, they were just living the dream, man. Yeah, and and the idea about uh, Lord of, Lord of a Dance. I want to get to this because he wasn't just a pharmaceutical drug lord. We're having fun with the term, but he definitely knew how to make money dance. Uh, he was as involved with finance, non related to uh, the pharmaceutical industry, as he was with drugs. Uh, he's an engineer. He has a keen mind for business. At the height of his fortune, he personally had an estimated well. It's tough when you talk about billionaires. He had an estimated $3.2 billion in personal net worth in 2017. In Canada, that made him somewhere between the 12th to 15th richest individual in the country. Really makes you wonder about those other 11, right? Do they have meetings? Do they get together? What are their schedules like? We'll never know. Um, but maybe let's learn a little bit about his background, just so you can, you can get a sense of this person. If you are, uh, if you live in Canada or have spent time in Canada, you almost certainly know the name Barry Sherman, but you definitely know the name of his company. Yeah, um, he started a career in pharmaceuticals when his uncle Louis Lloyd Winter's estate uh, let him take over Empire uh, Laboratories which is the company that his uncle ran. And in 1974, Barry would form his own pharmaceutical company called uh, Apotex? Ap- Apotex? Tomato, uh, tomato. Yeah, indeed, incorporated. Um, he led this company to uh, greatness, at least, you know, drug greatness. He led them to become the biggest manufacturer of generic drugs in all of Canada. It's kind of a big deal. Um, the company alone employs thousands of folks, and they sell drugs in 115 countries. So while we can't exactly say that he, you know, started from, uh, what, first base, you know, square one from nothing, uh, he definitely did, you know, do what we have often seen, you know, folks. Like even, uh, what's his name, Ben? We talked about him on Ridiculous History recently. Donald um, Trump? Well, Donald Trump, <laughs> well, no, I, I, think, I think he's not this example. It's... Uh, 
Getty, um, who, you know, the the younger son of the original, you know, Getty fortune holder, he did take his father was very stingy. He did take some seed money and then turn it into something of, of use. So this guy sort of again, he had a little bit of help, a little bit of push, but he, you know, definitely was a smart fellow um, who made the most of this opportunity that he was given. Oh, yeah. And there's there's an interesting note here, too, because uh, I, I love that you're pointing this out. So he gets he gets his original spot as an, a tycoon in this industry due to his uncle, his uncle's passing. Uh, his uncle had four kids and they did not get uh, the ability to run Empire Laboratories. They got a uh, or. According to them, they each were promised a 5% stake in the business, and they were very angry with right. Barry Sherman. Right. Yep, we're laying some groundwork. They were very angry when he shut them down in court because he was selling Empire Laboratories, which also further propelled him toward the capital and position he needed to create Apotex or Apotex. And um, it's weird to think about. Like cutting off the family tree in kind of a not great way, Barry. A little pruning, you know what I mean? Uh, Maybe why you don't do business with family. But family discord aside, he had, uh, it was a long time marriage uh, with Honey, which you mentioned earlier, Matt. Uh, His spouse, Honey Sherman, they married in 1971. And they had four children of their own, three girls, one boy. And Honey was um, Honey was known in many different ways by many different people. You can find accounts of folks who live in the area who say that she was very rude at the coffee shop or very privileged. But that's what, you know, waking up with a billion dollars will do to people sometimes. And uh, then you'll see other people saying that she did tremendous good as a philanthropist. She was very active uh, in, especially in charities associated with the Jewish community in Canada and abroad. So they were trying to put their money towards some charitable actions. This is not to say that they had no enemies. The, the, the people who knew the Shermans were not unanimously members of a Sherman fan club. As a matter of fact, Barry was known for being a bit of a bulldog. <laughs> yeah. Uh, as you said, he he knew the drug game, the manufacture of them, but mostly the sale of them. Uh, he also knew how to put his money to work for him, right? So any profits that he brought in, he could make those sing and dance. Uh, but he also really seemed to enjoy taking people to court when he needed to. Or when he felt like there was familiar. something to gain. <laughs> yeah. Litigious, was he? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, very much so. Um, and some of it's weird because he was actually in his day, he was like the most litigious individual in all of Canada. It's another extreme of this larger than life figure. And about I saw an estimate might have been from the author uh, Kevin Donovan, but I saw an estimate that said maybe around half of his courtroom battles were just out of necessity being a generic drug manufacturer. Uh, but then another half were just that he was he was a real hot and cold guy. If he loved you, he loved you. And he was a big fan and he would support you even when his friends told him not to. And if he thought you had wronged him, he would do evil things, very petty things. Like uh, he wins that lawsuit against his four cousins right after he sells their father's company. And then he, when he wins the lawsuit, it's not enough. This is a true story. He goes back to the court and he says, uh, these four people have to pay me a million dollars for my troubles. The court later kicks it down to uh, $300,000, but he's already financially ruined them. He just wanted to twist the knife. Uh, That's the environment we're moving in. And that's his family. That's his family. Um, so, you know, naturally, you're you're this high, you're at this threshold in, in the upper echelons of business. There's a lot of ruthlessness involved in getting there and maintaining that king of the hill position. So naturally, this guy's going to have rivals, of course. Naturally, there are going to be people who uh, maybe got burned in a lawsuit or uh, feel like he did them dirty in a business deal, and they don't think of him as their best friend, you know. Uh, they're not in his MySpace top eight. 
if MySpace is still around. Um, but you'll hear a lot of people say, that's just, this is business. That's just the breaks. That's how the sausage gets made. That's how you succeed in a profit motivated ecosystem. Until that is, something goes wrong. In December of 2017, Horror struck one of the most powerful families in Canada, Barry and Honey Sherman, were murdered. And now, even five years later, their deaths remain unsolved, leading more than a few people to speculate there may be a conspiracy afoot. Here's where it gets crazy. The Shermans were last seen alive on the 13th of September at the headquarters of Apotex, um, where they were taking a look, giving the once over and the approval for some design changes to a new house that they were building. Miss Sherman was um, getting ready to take a trip to Miami a few days later, and Mr. Sherman was going to join her a week later. And the Shermans, we just we should just note here, they had built a house earlier. So they're building this new house, right? But they had earlier built a house in the 1980s, and this house they were preparing for sale. So if anyone who's gone through that process, you know that uh, they were basically having to go to the old house pretty frequently, make repairs, or at least oversee repairs and things that were being done to that house. And that happens to be where they head at some point um, on either December 13th or 14th. Yeah, and there's you'll see some conflicting reporting about this uh, this kind of forty eight to seventy two hour period between December thirteenth and December fifteenth. But here here is what we know from the official records. All right, like like Noel said, December thirteenth, last time anybody publicly admits to seeing them. Mm-hmm. You like that careful phrasing there on. The 15th, just a few days later, a pair of realtors is giving a tour of this mansion in Toronto. And it's around midday. Uh, And as they get to uh, the bottom of the house, they're doing the walkthrough. You know, you're buying a mansion. It's a significant investment. You want to look at the nooks and crannies. So they get toward the bottom of the house to the basement. And then they find the bodies of Barry and Honey Sherman uh, fully dressed And they're positioned, we should say, beside their indoor basement swimming pool, semi-seated, side by side, belts tied around their necks, attached to the railing of the indoor pool. Yeah. And um, at least I think it was in Barry's case, he was kind of leaned back because that belt was keeping him upright. Mm-hmm. Um, really messed up, really, really messed up, but it definitely seems as though they were posed, right? Yeah, that's, that's one of the, that's where this starts to get a little bit true detective season one, to be honest with you. So at the times of their deaths, Barry is 75, honey is 70 years old. She has a bruise on her face. Both bodies have been restrained with coats pulled over their arms. Later autopsies would confirm they died due to strangulation. Although that seems pretty clear at the scene, you got to let forensics do their work, right? And, and look for all the details that indicate, you know, whether or not something was a suicide. Shout out to Epstein's hyoid bone. <laughs> Seriously, right? Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. always the little telltale signs. Um, and and we've got something along those lines here from the author of The Billionaire Murders, a guy named Kevin Donovan. Uh, the body seemed to have been purposefully arranged. Um, this is, again, this is like true detective kind of, you know, serial killer, elaborate kind of behavior kind of stuff. Uh, the body seemed to have been purposefully arranged in an imitation of two life-size sculptures that existed in the couple's home. Not far at all from where they were found. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You can look at a photograph of this sculpture. Uh, we want to note that poor Leo Sewell is not a suspect. There are a lot of suspects here, just to be honest with you, but Leo's not one. He's just a, a guy making a living through his art, which is a, a awesome thing to be able to do. Then probably never imagined that he would be involved with something like this, even tangentially. It's it's kind of like a found object art sort of, yeah. or like outsider art kind of vibe. And then it gets stuff. referred to as junk sculpture. And this dude was active in the seventies. Um, and I mean, they're they're cool 
pieces, if not creepy unto themselves, I have to say. The kids the, did not like those at all. Well, they no. look, yeah. I mean, when you look at it with all the whatever pipes and little pieces, it kind of looks like skinned humans, but like in a weird junkyard kind of way. It is, and they're sitting on top of speakers. Yes, they look they like hi fi yeah. speakers. First of all, as an audiophile, that is not a good place for it. That's going to cause some serious <laughs> vibrations. You're not going to get the best quality, okay, out of your speakers when you've got these metal, you know, monstrosities sitting on top but of it. But look at the That's TV. neither here nor there. That's a 2017 TV, guys. Look at it's that TV. Just, yeah, it's well, you like a don't TV. make money by spending a bunch of money <laughs> on frivolous things. I say as I, I as I drink dirt coffee out of like a, a spaghetti jar from probably two thousand and nine. Uh, I know what you mean. Like <laughs> it, it is disquieting because they are. Yeah, they were not popular with the kids. These are life size figures. Uh, something gives it a, a crash test dummies vibe to me almost. And um, and you can see how you know if you grow up, anybody who's grown up with life size sculptures or mannequins or stuff like that, you realize how that can creep you out as a kid. And they had apparently in the past, all four of the kids had asked their parents, please put these just. Somewhere else. If you can't throw them away, just put them somewhere else. Uh, but the mother, honey, liked them so much. She really enjoyed them. So she said, no, it's our house. They're staying here. Well, and she actually borrowed them or, to, or asked to have them from a friend who mm -hmm. had them displayed after. Mm -hmm. Oh, man, I, I'm sorry, Ben. I can't remember the exact thing from the research, but they some um, place that had them displayed closed down. And they were they were taken by a, a couple, and then Honey was like, "I really like those. I want to put them in my basement." And that's what happened. Yeah, yeah, because uh, she's so big in the world of uh, the arts and charity and philanthropy that uh, organizations want to please her, as do people. So it's kind of a social coup for them to be able to say, I give this gift to you. Anyway, we're harping on these statues because the bodies when they are found, even, even if you had never seen the statue before, the bodies when they are found are in a very similar position. Two life-size statues, two corpses, as, as though um, arranged as though uh, in homage to the statue, right? And when Kevin Donovan, who is probably the world's foremost expert on this case now, when he is looking into the origin of the sculpture, he's the guy who uh, finds the artist, Leo. He said that everything he looked into about this, from when he was first writing about it at the Toronto Star to when he, he came out with his book, he just couldn't figure out why they were staged. Pretty confident he is that they were staged that way on purpose. But he said, uh, I don't know what it means. But, quote, I can't see how it doesn't mean something. You right. know what I mean? Just like, again, I'm going to stop with the True Detective res, uh, references after this, but just like uh, Rust Cole, right? In the very first episode of True Detective Season 1. Uh, no spoilers, but what a show. Uh, this is unfortunately real life. So we're, we're setting up some of the stuff about the statue. This is one of many unanswered questions here. Uh, and if you want to go to the answers, right, then naturally, where do you start? You start with the people who knew the Shermans and the authorities who were put on the case. So we're going to pause for a word from our sponsors, and then let's, let's go right to Toronto PD. Let's see what they have to say. All right, let's jump back in here. And we're still in December 14, December 15, 2017. And we're, uh, we're looking at statements from the Toronto police. And, you know, it's really just questions about, did any associates of the Shermans hear from them within that window? Did anyone, you know, have any idea what their plans were in that immediate term? Were they heading back to that house for a specific reason? Uh, you know, just any information. And according to the Toronto police, there was nothing to go on here. There were no leads, according to anybody who knew them. They hadn't seen them for at least two days or around two days. And when they start looking at the crime scene, you know, with the strange staging of the victims, with those weird statues, 
you look you look for signs of entry. Did somebody bust in through a window to gain access to them and kill them? Well, it's a little weird because there are no signs of forced entry, right? Any kind mm-hmm. of like brute force trauma to any door or window or anything like that. But there were there was some weirdness. Yeah, like uh I believe it was uh, one of the doors was unlocked, which is something their household staff, yes, folks, they had a staff, their household staff knew, right? They had Mm -hmm. a door that was typically unlocked for convenience. Uh, There was also an open window, but no no signs that either had been forced, clearly not a kick door operation. Someone either was let into the home or someone knew where, which methods of entry would be uh, feasible and would leave the, would have the, sorry, lowest likelihood of leaving a trace. I got two things here, guys. Uh, According to the reporting, this is something the Shermans would do often. Like you said, ask the staff to leave a couple of entries open on purpose, or they would do it on purpose just to leave stuff unlocked. Yeah. That baffles me. Uh, (laughs) Is it like some kind of like kinky game or something? I'm sorry. No. I don't mean to be. I think it's just alarmist. a very foreign idea to the three of us in particular that you would ever just leave your house unlocked. But, but yeah. you instruct them to do it. It's almost like they're rolling the dice a little bit. You know what I mean? I don't know. I know like, what you mean. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you're just going to kind of forget to do it or not worry about it too much, but shouldn't the standard protocol just always be just lock the door when you're done? Like if yeah. you're leaving? You know, and maybe this was um, see, this is something that we don't have fully answered. Like, was this a habit that had gone on for years? Right. This will be an important question. Or was this something that had happened relatively recently as they were transitioning to their new abode? Unclear. Or did it have something to do with someone who had toured the house recently as a potential buyer? Which I okay, a little inside job. Right. There we go. We're, we're assigning some sophistication now. Uh, and this actually, as we'll see, this is not your ordinary crime of opportunity by any means. So the other thing, they had recently installed a lockbox that the staff was using to come and go. So it is reasonable for us to assume that they had some of their people maybe coming in and moving possessions or checking on stuff or you know, well, um, and and again to show the house, you know, so realtor can to show the house, grab the key and show mm-hmm. people. Yeah, and so something weird happens in Toronto. Um, the police, not the band, the Toronto PD. Initially, the the police were called in, but uh, their schedule was just too massive, and you know they're mainly musicians nowadays. But Toronto PD was called in uh, as a replacement, and they initially called this a murder-suicide. The idea being, uh, in their initial statements, that Barry Sherman strangled, asphyxiated his wife of many years, and then did the same to himself. The public was not buying this. I mean, the belt, you know, is typically a hallmark of of suicide, you know, but Mm -hmm. it also seemed to serve the purpose of kind of posing them as well in this situation. Yeah, that's part of it. Like the, if that narrative was true and they just coincidentally ended up in positions very much like those statues, it's one of those things where you would almost have to prove it was a coincidence. Now, how chilling though, if it were that Mm -hmm. and it were Barry that did the posing and then he would have to like pose that, pose himself that way and then do the thing. But also, you know, you kind of spasm and things happen as you die. Right. It'd be hard to maintain that pose post-mortem without someone kind of fixing it up. Mm-hmm. No matter how good or evil, how, how, how socially great or unremarkable a person is, pretty much all go the same way unless they're vaporized instantly. You know, they shiver that's, a little. That's they a fun thought, their bowels. Ben. I'm wow. not a fun parties. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's the great equalizer. <laughs> Everybody go the party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but uh, I mean, we're we're trying not to make this incredibly um, dark, I guess. But it is 
it is it is a dark subject. And I think we're raising valid points, right? There's just not enough information, but there's a lot of stuff that sticks out, like the cell phone. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're talking about the murder suicide initial thing. Then they the police kind of switched gears pretty soon after that because there is additional evidence that they find at the scene. And one of those things is honey cell phone that you're talking about that was found in a powder room that according to associates and friends who knew her. She never used that thing. That wasn't like the place where she goes and her cell phones in there. And they believe at least the one of the working theories is that she fled something or someone and made it to that powder room as possibly an attempt to dial authorities or, you know, dial for help basically with her phone. Um, do we, are we going to talk about this? The other weird thing is a stack of papers that I guess Barry had and his gloves. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Lay it on us. Well, th- those were found very near the entrance, the side door entrance to the home where, uh, both Honey and Barry would always just kind of go into the house. So it seems as though perhaps he walked into the home and was e- either immediately confronted by someone or heard something that made him run, like put that stuff down and take off. Right, because he's not, like most people, he's not the kind of guy who gets to the door to his house and says, oh, let me just drop all my stuff outside. You know what I mean? Uh I can't, I can't walk into my house with my gloves. What am I, a farmer? He, you know, he's not that kind of dude. But yeah, they, they do take a while to revise their findings based on this evidence. And they come back and they have these the series of press statements and they say, and they're talking to Toronto Star as well. And they say, we are now treating this case not as a murder-suicide, but as a double homicide. and um. Some of this is informed by professionals who look at the scene, right? We'll get to them in a second. But the Sherman family is a financial powerhouse, right? They uh, have a lot of differences. Money can come between people. But they go past the police. They go and hire their own kind of private investigation team. And they release a statement just before the police press conference where they say we anticipate the the police will reach the same conclusion as our PIs, which is that this is a homicide. Our parents were murdered. And uh, things just get stranger. Public speculation grows. The police are searching for any leads. And at almost every single turn, they found more questions than answers. All right. So uh, one question um, that comes to mind first is why did it take so long for the police to rule the deaths a double homicide? Um, It was a tall order for just about anybody uh, involved from the start um, that Barry Sherman would kill his wife and then himself. Also, if uh, Honey had been murdered in a different part of the house, Barry would have had to drag her body down to the the scene uh, where they were found, to this kind of uh, tableau kind of scene. Um, And he was, you know, he he was older and lacked the strength to, to likely be able to do that, let alone the whole post thing that we we talked about a minute ago. Um, So it's pretty unlikely that he would have been able to do that, even part of that. And even less possible once we uh, examine some additional details. Um, There are marks on both of their wrists that indicated that they had possibly been zip tied at some point. Um, So that's super sketchy and really renders that scenario Entirely unlikely. Yeah, I want to point something out here. The home that they were in is roughly 12,000 square feet. 12,000 square feet. That's a huge home. And if you imagine just carrying the weight of the dead weight of a human body or even, you know, carrying someone who is still alive, who's maybe unconscious or something, down a huge set of stairs and across a really long way to the pool where they were found, uh, it is... It doesn't seem possible. I may have missed it. Where, where, where do we see that there is a belief that she was killed in another part of the house? Uh, the idea that she had the um, the, the bruise, abrasia, the bruise on her na- on her face, and uh, that are uh, the location of that cell phone. Got it. So Got there's it. there's no like trail spare of bathroom, blood. right? Pretty much like a powder room, like you said, Matt. So 
So for those of us playing along at home, you'll start to notice more and more things point to the possibility of not a crime of passion or of opportunity, but something premeditated, something planned, which looks more and more like what we could call a professional exercise. Uh, and that's would we call That's it that? Deep water. Professional yeah. exercise? Sure, yeah. Uh, I mean, there. you know, again, I think of movies like Seven and like yeah. uh, uh, even like Taxidermia, which is a real weird one where a guy like <laughs> right. taxidermies himself at the end. Spoiler alert. Uh, it's 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 kind of in the name. Um, but uh, yeah, it really, the, the tab, again, I keep using this word because this is what they always use in uh, these psychoanalytical kind of like murder movies, the tableau, you know, the scene that was laid out. Um, another really interesting show uh, a Spanish show called Epitafios um, that is on HBO it's, it's older but it's like really good and it's just like a like a murder mystery where this murderer is acting out all of these uh, kind of clues in the way he's leaving the body and again not trying to liken this to fiction it's obviously real life and this horrible thing that happened to these people but you can't help but go there if you're a fan of this kind of true crime fiction stuff right yeah agreed I mean here's the thing uh you can sadly already draw a sharp contrast between the way the law treats double homicides of non-billionaires and double homicides of people who have a lot of political and social and financial heft. The, it's very clear that the, um, the Sherman family's private team was able to put some extra oomph into the investigation. And it's not a ding on the police forces who are often understaffed, underfunded, and overworked, right? But another voice that changed their opinion was the chief medical examiner for the county. The chief medical examiner heard the initial explanation, a Dr. May Chase, and Dr. Chase went on record saying, if this is a murder-suicide by hanging, it will be the first one recorded in history, um, which might sound a little hyperbolic. But, well, yeah, uh, can we unpack that a little bit? Meaning, like, that both died from hanging? That would yeah, be the, the, that's the what criteria that's there. Yeah, yeah, got it. Because a murder-suicide, you know— well, at least here in the States, it's it's often going to be uh, firearm related or firearm powered. But still, it took a like your question is great because it did take six weeks before the police switched their conclusion. And again, Kevin Donovan, uh, who has done so much awesome journalism on this, uh, says you can tell that Donovan is a little, uh, at the very least, put diplomatically confused by some of the initial actions of the Toronto PD. Uh, he says, you know, they ignored crucial evidence, uh, video footage from a neighbor's home, which we'll get to in a moment. Uh, and then he also notes, which is very surprising to me, you guys, I mean, we're not legally experts, we don't do crime scenes, but uh, he, he says they didn't collect DNA they didn't dust for for fingerprints in a timely fashion. Yeah, well, I mean, that's nuts. That is nuts. And and it's because they were treating it like a, a self-inflicted incident at the house, right? Mm. Um, if it's a murder-suicide, they don't have to worry about anybody else who may or may not have been in that house at the time. So they don't have to even think about that. And if you're operating that way as a police force for six full weeks, you are going to lose a ton of stuff that you could have probably picked on initially. Yeah, exactly, because there is a ticking clock, you know? And then we, we talked about the sculpture, but we got to make one more point, too. In If this is the work of, you know, a professional or career operator, then why? what gives with the bodies? That's not necessary to accomplish the task. That's something extra, right? That's that's the order in guacamole to be very crass about it. That's upon request. And it's probably more expensive if we're if we're talking about, you know, just to say the quiet part out loud, a paid hit. Well, in the time spent at a murder scene. Yes. Even more important. Right. A professional would be painfully aware of that. Right. And they would already have an exit strategy. Right. Possibly out of the country if they're smart. And on some level. That means there's a symbolic meaning to the to the statues and the posing, but we don't know what that 
what that's supposed to symbolize. We don't know who that message is supposed to have meaning for. It's like, um, it's, you know what? It's on the level of a Russian number station. It's something weird, but where is that message supposed to be sent? Yeah, you gotta have the you gotta have the key to decipher it, you know. Otherwise, what even is it, guys? I'm just having a thought, and we should probably save this for the end. But if you're a let's say an equally wealthy or almost as wealthy person who wants to have something like this done, and you could easily afford it, um, you may also have strings to pull in the police department to get them to investigate it as a murder suicide. Just putting that out mm-hmm. there. It's a very good thing to put out well, it, there. It's also a thing you see. I'm sorry I keep doing this. But it's just kind of where my knowledge of this kind of stuff comes from in crime shows where uh, there'll be some brass that doesn't want to, to declare that we've got ourselves a serial killer or doesn't mm-hmm. want mm-hmm. to rule it a certain way because of political reasons or perhaps because of pressure from some direction or another. Just like Jaws, the novel Jaws, where where they're they're covering up uh, the shark attacks at a seaside town for tours. It's very, no, it has nothing in common to do with <laughs> Jaws. As a matter of fact, we can say conclusively, add to the list uh, people who definitely did not do this: the sculptor Leo Sewell and every shark definitely. of any known species. Uh, so. There's, there's this other question. When you're talking about powerful forces, Matt, I love that because it could be an equally powerful person who is holding a grudge, knowing that they can uh, touch people in in the uh, law enforcement infrastructure such that things get lost, things get buried, things get epstein but uh, they don't have to live in town. What, what if this tragedy is somehow related to the pharmaceutical industry? That's one of the first things people started to speculate about, right? Because the pharmaceutical industry overall is a huge business. It is global. It can sometimes act like a state actor. It's just very powerful. Um, And (laughs) we found a source that uh, we thought you all would enjoy because we do talk about the importance of knowing the provenance of a source, right? So, PharmaVoice.com, a little bit of a skewed source, uh, addresses this directly, and they say they dismiss the idea of a plot by big pharma actors uh, entirely. They say, you know, it's a common conspiracy theory, and then they say that there are rumors there was uh, a generic drug manufacturer out of Israel that could have done it, or that the Clinton Foundation ordered the hit because Apotex was sending generic drugs to Puerto Rico, Haiti, and Rwanda. Uh, And this guy, again, Kevin Donovan, talk about punishing the honor student. This guy says he continues to get calls today with people either asking him about a potential connection to Big Pharma or kind of telling him or seeming like they know. Well, but, but also, like, I mean, I know you're not talking about drug cartels, but if you're talking about bad actors from another country wanting to kind of make an impact or, like, send a message, you don't do something mega cryptic. You, like, chop their heads off or something. You know, you leave a calling card. And maybe, I mean, yeah, like Polonium in Russia, right? Or mm-hmm. all those dangerous third-story windows. Uh, I, I think in this case, that, that calling card, whatever it is, it, it, again, it's the posing of the bodies, you know? Very macabre. But the... um I don't know. The the main thing that gives any sand to the idea of, big, uh, of a pharmaceutical actor being involved or that somehow motivating the deaths is that Barry had a ton of legal enemies, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And I would just, I want to give this quote, Ben, that you found from, what is this, Jeffrey Robinson's book? Mm-hmm. Uh, book title, if you want to look it up, is Prescription Games, Money, Ego, and Power Inside the Global Pharmaceutical Industry. And Robinson, the author of this book, actually talked with Barry, and Barry had something very interesting to say. Oh, uh, you should do it. You should do it. No, okay, sure. Um, according to the author, Barry told him uh, that he was surprised one of his competitors hadn't, quote, knocked him off already. Unquote. This is, of course, before his passing. Hyperbole, maybe? Yeah. I I mean, he's kind of joking with it, right? Like, I've really gotten over on a bunch of these other companies. So it's weird they haven't taken me out. Right. You know, and and 
the weirdest thing is a lot of that comes down to intonation, doesn't it? There's, oh, yeah. there's a huge difference between saying, I'm surprised they haven't knocked me off already, or I'm surprised they haven't knocked me off already. You know what I mean? Nice. Like it's very small things, but, but like the, all of this is rich, fertile soil for speculation, but it's not proof. It's just people saying, hey, we know aspects of the pharmaceutical industry are super shady. Hey, we know this guy went hard in business dealings. But if we're looking for evidence, then we need to look at things like that surveillance video, which you can see online right now. Uh, you just can't. Uh, it's not super helpful, but I think it's, it's <laughs> damning when you consider the context. Yeah, well, right. why don't we why don't we take a break? You go watch that video and then come right back and we'll talk about it. And we're back. Let's let's describe the video a little bit. It's like uh, you know, um like Noel, you have you have one of those cameras, right? You have a front door camera? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I got the ring. Yeah, so so you can see footage from that camera angle, but it's it's not like uh it's a stationary camera, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, usually mount them somewhere or, you know, have them, yeah, placed somewhere, kind of innocuous or hidden. Uh, but, yeah, it's like a wide-angle kind of fisheye type lens, so it definitely grabs a good bit of stuff. Uh, it's a pretty pretty wide shot. And this is, this is something to keep in mind. Like, hopefully you were able to watch the video over the break. In this video, keep in mind our friends for more tropical climbs. This is Canada. It's the time of the year when there's snow everywhere. What does snow mean? Footprints, right? Uh, there's a residential street that's not like right next to the Sherman estate, but it's it's very near to the Sherman home. And if you look at this footage, which is police got from someone living in the area, uh, it's security cam footage, not high def or anything like that, of a guy, of a figure walking down the sidewalk, some time passes, and what is almost certainly the same figure walks back the way it came. You'll hear this called the walking man footage yeah. sometimes. But police can't even tell it's a man. There's like one thing they know about this figure. Yeah, they kind of know the height of this person. Somewhere between 5'6 and 5'9". I would imagine there'd be a formula you could use to see how the lens distortion and like, you know, other stationary objects and all of that and kind of cross reference and get an accurate uh, representation of that from even kind of crappy surveillance footage. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely it, it's an estimate, right, of how tall that person is, because y'all, uh, this person has a, a gait that is very unique. Well, the way they walk is, is unique. And that's one of the reasons that you can say, oh, this is the same person that went that away and then came back this way. I wonder what it was. I wonder if it was just like, you know, the keep on trucking guy, you know, from the R. Crumb cartoons. Or, <laughs> right. You know, I mean, like like a real wide-legged kind of walk. Or if it was like a yeah. verbal Kent thing. Exactly. A suspects. limp, perhaps. Yeah. A, a bit of a saunter. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm interested. <laughs> well, um, he wasn't. He, he definitely wasn't like on some dosy do energy. He wasn't, you know, skipping along. But, but a lot of us listening along today would say, well, if I see somebody with a particularly unusual gait uh, in this kind of climate, it can mean a couple things. It can mean uh, they are injured. One, it could mean, but they were if they were injured, they were injured before. They went wherever they were going. Uh, two, it could just suck to walk in rough, rough weather, right? Maybe maybe they're they're cold and they're just tired of walking. So what made them turn yeah. around, right? That's a good point. Maybe their yeah, shoe, where their right shoe is broken a little bit. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe they. Uh, here's the other thing. I'm not saying this is true, but maybe they have a concealed weapon. Hmm. Right. And it would have to be it would have to be something that was concealed in such a way that it was affecting their gait. Uh, you would need to be an expert on a couple of things to be able to tell what someone was carrying by the way they were walking. Right. Even even like um, even people with a lot of experience 
and spotting, you know, a concealed firearm, they'll be able to tell by the way someone moves or the way their jacket is sitting on Bulging. their body. Right, yeah. exactly. That, but they, that's won't, the, yeah. they mm. won't be able to guess the specific firearm. No. Right? Yeah, they might be able to guess the type or the, the size of, right. of, of, of object that they're, they're concealing. But no, I mean, I, I don't know that anything that you could conceal like that would like change your walk in a significant way. There would be some telltale sign. I, mean, I guess saying, a shotgun, but that yeah, feels uh, really, shotgun. Yeah, really that's stupid. True. That's true. I saw mm-hmm. a Mossberg down a pant leg and I was like, huh, probably wouldn't be able to do that. <laughs> <laughs> right. I guess I just don't think of those as the kinds of weapons you uh, conceal unless you're doing some sort of trench coat. Yeah. Or down the pant leg cartoonish kind of thing, you know, or you're aware there's a camera. Right, so you mess up your gate, just like Verbal Kent, spoiler, uh, to get away, uh, or to not be identified, right? That is a very clever idea, Matt, and I like that. And it also it also explains the big problem with the idea of a concealed weapon. If you are caught, if you run into anybody, and you've got you've got a weapon and you can't explain why you have it, where you're going or where you're coming from, right? Then you have immediately escalated the problems involved in your situation. So, okay. So there's a sketchy person. And if, you know, it's very reasonable to say, what if this person, just just someone who had to like walk to a neighbor's house, someone who forgot something somewhere and they walk and they're like, ah, oh, crap. And they walked out and then they walked back, right? Uh, possibly. Right. But if that's the case, if this is an innocent person, why have they not come forward? Why have they yet to be identified? What what gives? Right. I mean, one possibility would be that they were doing something shady that was unrelated and they just didn't want to get caught. You know, like they're they're sneaking out to to party or maybe to like buy drugs or have illicit uh, sexual stuff. Uh, So they're not going to come forward in that case. but. That's that's like winning the lottery twice for that to happen, you know? Yeah. Guys, I want to get back to this concept of the open door and open window. Yes. J- just a little bit. Because I really, I think the timing of the house sale factors into this in some way. And that lock, the like you, like you said, the... What do they call it? Is it a lockbox? The thing that you put out on the front of a door so a realtor can <laughs> yeah. get yeah, the lock? Yeah, it's just like a little, little – usually come from Master Lock is the company, and it's just got a little window in it, you know, a you know, little, little analog kind of code. 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 Yeah. yeah, Some of them, some of them are fancier, but I think a lock – it's a type of lockbox, very specific purpose to fit around a doorknob. I, I, I think there's something to someone touring the home and – unlocking a window while they're on that tour because that is a really effective way to create an opening for yourself if you're planning to return at some point yeah matt i i agree with you because that is an efficient way that houses get cased uh but it's also it also would only be worth that further exposure if someone uh didn't know the basement was typically unlocked, you know, yeah. they would, they would have to not know that, or maybe they're super buttoned up and they get the window just as insurance as a secondary, right. right. Which you would want redundancy ideally, but like then you, but then you have to uh, see, I love spinning this out. Right. Um, then, then you would have to ideally have another person involved because I'm, I'm certain that everybody who, toward the house got questioned right it's it's a it's a mansion it's a mansion in toronto which has a crazy cost of living even then the real estate prices were nuts so it's a very specific demographic that's going into these mansions well then here here it is ben here's the scenario uh some very wealthy person who could actually purchase that home toward it maybe with a spouse with their family or alone and they open the window for the professional they hired to enter later Right. Because at a certain level, you don't do a lot of stuff yourself. You have a staff of some sort, right? Uh, whether that's cleaning your house or cleaning out your, uh, your, your vengeance list. Uh, right. th- that, it's also anomalous, though, because knowing the weather at that time, why would you have a window open? I wouldn't. No. Most people would not, right? Uh, so I think 
for all of us and probably uh, our fellow listeners, that lack of forced entry is um, is a key sticking point, right? It's it's a problem with all the scenarios that that we try to walk through. So let's go back to our expert author, Kevin Donovan, author and journalist, Kevin Donovan, who says that this, based on the other research he conducted, this to him indicates that the murderer must have somehow been incredibly familiar with the interior of the home. And not just that, but likely had a a pretty sophisticated working knowledge of the Sherman's routine and schedules. And that's kind of why if you are, you know, (laughs) that's kind of why some of us put a lot of energy into uh, not having an easily discernible routine, right? (laughs) Like uh, other than than, uh, when we are podcasting or when we know we're getting together to do stuff for Hangout, the three of us don't know where the other ones are. I think well, it's just a good policy. Come on. All right. Come on. <laughs> now let's just leave it there. Let's just leave it there. <laughs> we, we, we do you guys, look, just everyone, we, we do some like mutual, I don't know. I think it's just a game of cat and mouse fun tracking each other thing. It's, it's fun. It's like what we do for fun. Who Are you doing like a royal we? Because I, I just I'm not us doing on this that. show. What? Okay. You don't do that. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, here's a here's a trick though. If you do think that someone is doing some kind of untoward tracking, and you need to throw them off for any reason, right? Uh, one of the things that you can do very easily is just figure out how much time you need to buy, and then take your phone, your cell phone. And put it on, uh, like, put it on mass transit, where it'll get stolen, and someone else will take it. Uh, you could, if you want to involve someone else, put it in like a privately owned car or something uh, with their consent. It's the only way it's legal. Yeah, the best thing for me is record like high fidelity television show mm-hmm. uh, with a separate mic, then play that back in a place in your house that. Uh, has a television, has a capability to like play that that content, and then go do your business. Uh, but but make sure you it sounds of you watching the TV inside the recording. Yeah, I like that one. <laughs> it's a, it's a little extra work. Like our our conversation where you and I were very much saying that you you got to reheat pizza in the pan. It's just oh, better. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Except it's I just a little, put it in the oven anyway. <laughs> right. It's a little extra work, but it improves the end result. This conversation just went through a couple of very strange places. <laughs> but, but, um, but yeah, there, so what we're doing is we're, we're endeavoring to think in a very grounded way through the problems, right? Because again, even the police investigation, even the private investigation just led to more questions. So far as we know, now at this point, you know, folks, we we only do two part episodes when we feel very strongly about what we need to get to. And this is one of those situations. So we are going to pause here at part one of who killed the Shermans. uh, And we're going to return in our very next episode with part two. But in the meantime, we want to know what you think. That's right. Let us know what you think. You can reach us at Conspiracy Stuff on Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook. Conspiracy Stuff Show on Instagram. We have a phone number, one eight three three stdwytk When you call in, give yourself a cool nickname, and you've got three minutes, say whatever you'd like. Let us know if we can use your name and voice on one of our listener mail episodes, and those are the only rules. If you don't like using your phone to give us a call, why not send us an email? We are conspiracy at iheartradio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.